Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of On a Distant Ridgeline Stories by Sam Rees. Uh, so this was sent to me by Isabel Kenyon of Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. Um, there isn't actually really a, a blurb of this, I don't think. It's basically a collection of diff different short stories, um, all brought together along a similar theme. Uh, so we have And the Glowworms, Sing, At, Small Homes, I Go Astray, Cataracts, The Difference, An Experience, What Comes Next, Words, Gatherers, A Lone Figure on a Distant Ridge Line, and Magpies. And then an author's note at the end. So these are very literary short stories. I mean, there are plots to them, but the plots aren't necessarily that important, so I'm not going to go into major details. Um, instead, I think this is one of those where really the, the extracts that I read are going to be what are going to help you to decide whether it's for you or not, you know? Dane reads. And so here um, they're talking about a book. And we get, from your passionate performance in class, I thought you must be a serious reader, she said. He thought she was smirking, but he wasn't sure. Then she said, there aren't many of us around here. What are you looking at, she asked. When he showed her the cover, she said, he hated women, didn't he? I don't know much about him as a person, Felix said, but I like the way he writes, the rhythm and the clarity. Uh, I don't think it's clarified which writer they're talking about there, but I mean, it could be Hemingway or Bukowski. And I just thought this was a really nice little bit of characterization here and like a really like clever idea. It's like little details like this that I think marks sort of mediocre writing and uh, good writing apart. So instead of talking about the book, they spent the walk up the hill discussing her younger sisters and the problems of having your mother as your teacher. She mentioned that you have a brother, she said, as they turned off the road and started up the dirt track that led through the bush towards the point. Josh, Felix said, yeah, he's a strange one. He glanced at Hanson and said, He's a pain sometimes, but mostly we get along. He was excited to start school, and every morning of the holidays he would wake me up and ask how much longer he still had to wait. Until the last leaf has fallen from that tree, I said, pointing to a little beach outside on our street. Every time we walked past it after that, he'd pull off a leaf or two to make it hurry up. And here we actually get specifically a reference to Hemingway. And I just thought it was interesting because uh, I'd either just read Hemingway or I was just about to read some Hemingway when I was reading this, because uh, I've recently read... Uh, for whom the bell tolls. If they had talked much about history, the times they met up here, he could not remember now. It had hardly seemed important even then. It was what she had to say about everything else, acting, poetry, life. She had discovered Hemingway and took Orhan's resistance as a personal challenge. Orhan sighed and inhaled the wet smell the leaves always gave off in late summer. From the gardens up ahead, he heard the long and mournful calls of a currawong. Somewhere, maybe in the stack of books his mother kept for him, there must be her copy of The Sun Also Rises, stained and warped along the bottom edge from her saltwater grasp. He had never remembered to return it. And this was just a nice little note about like theatrical masks. So we get Orpheus steps on stage. Masks are different, he knows, when they're in use. If you see one in repose, you wonder how anyone could be immersed by a performer hiding behind that. But on stage, beneath the lights, with feeling in the movement, they can look more real than naked expression. Which is very true. So here I'm going to move on to I Go Astray. And here, this is a little bit to do with like societal attitudes towards women. Papa, Julia said, Mama says I can't go. I know, little treasure. It is hard. Women can do anything and they should. But sometimes we have to listen to what other people feel. Do you remember what Papa told you about the way they would dig the tunnels here? She pulled her bottom lip in, the way she would if her parents pushed broccoli towards her on the plate. No women are allowed to dig. That's silly though. When we're in the garden, I can dig better than any of the boys. You sure can, but here they see the earth, and they say she is a woman. They believe it isn't right for women to attack another woman with shovels, trowels, or diggers, but that doesn't mean that women aren't important. I'm just going to read this, uh, this whole long paragraph out because I just think it's really beautifully written. We came from water once, Florian said quietly. Luhan nodded. When I dive deep, no equipment, just my heart and lungs, it is a return to a world I've lost. I feel naked, like us now, like us in that lake underneath a different moon. The tingling in the tips of my fingers and toes, it feels like I'm stretching out into something more. And everything is silent, everything is slow. That's why you need a partner, because once you learn the art of letting go, it is easy to embrace the emptiness. We had our own signal to let each other know we had not slipped away. He looked so calm that day that when he did not respond, at first I thought he had just found another plane of peace. She spoke softly, turned and met Florian's gaze. He was a few metres further down than me, down amongst the limitless gradations of depth. My feet had started to grow numb, thick and heavy. They did not respond the way they would in the world above. I reached him, though, wrapped my arms around his chest and felt the emptiness. Even then, as knowledge came to me, the panic did not grasp my throat. I kicked an even metronome, the same deep beat as my slow heart, and through that long ascent I felt the edges of me shimmer. It was only afterwards that the clouds set in, the anger, the sadness, the shame. As we rose towards the light, I was filled with joy. I didn't think I would find that again. 
You see, that day I lost my partner, the person who keeps watch who stops you slipping away. When that person goes, you feel cut adrift in open water, disoriented and alone. That's why I reached out to you, grasped for you every time I felt myself caught in the allure of the darkness, of the absence just beyond my fingertips. I thought I'd find him in you. So here we have the difference, and I'm just going to read the opening couple of paragraphs to this, um, because it's just really interesting stuff about colour, basically. And that, that's kind of the whole theme of this, this particular short story. Did you know the difference between blue and green is one of the hardest for us to distinguish? I know if you look out to the line of the horizon on the coast where the verdant swell of grass meets the endless stretch of cerulean heaven, then the difference is obvious, yawning before you in the sharp divide. It's the clarity of a blade against the sky. But if you step a bit closer to the edge, so the bands of blue and green, sky and earth, are separated by the ocean, maybe you'll see what I mean. The dark turquoise of the water occupies a middle ground, a brilliant bluish green, or would you say greenish blue? I think you would. And the thick folds of the ocean might remind you of the heavy wool of your school blazer, of the teal I know you despise. It's a tertiary colour, one that sits exactly midway between blue and green on the RYB colour scale in the fold. And uh, this just reminds me as well of, uh, I was reading uh, Noah Yuval Harari, no Yuval Noah Harari recently, and he was talking about flags and he said like to a colourblind person most flags just look the same. It's just three stripes of different colours. Later on in that story we get a reference to the sound of rain which I sometimes listen to when I fall asleep <laughs> and uh, Sam writes No one knows exactly why the sound of rain is so relaxing. It could be that it provides a veil against other sounds or gives our wandering night minds something onto which they can fixate. Then again it could be that it reminds us of a time when we were still in the womb and our lives were water. The other night when I woke around the same time I always seem to wake these days it was raining. At times like that, the rhythmic sound is usually a comfort, but as I went to the bathroom, I caught sight of veins of moonlight showing through the fabric of the darkened clouds. I started turning over these thoughts in my mind, and the noise made the ideas fall faster, so that even back in bed, I could not sleep until I propped open the window and inhaled the petrichor, thinking for a moment that perhaps somewhere nearby you could smell it too. Okie dokie, and this is uh, a lone figure on a distant ridge line, and this is just a fact that I thought was very cool, and I didn't know. So we get, he knew that most of the spaghetti westerns of the 1960s had been shot in Spain. Cheaper than filming in America, he told the boy. Cheaper to build sets and get extras too. But he hadn't realised when they made the turn off that this was the place where they had filmed so many of the films that he and the boy had watched. So yeah, On a Distant Ridgeline by Sam Rees. Uh, really beautiful, just sort of literary fiction short stories really. This to me kind of is a great example of why short stories should be published. I know um, like it's not very popular for publishing houses to publish short story collections, but this was just sort of experimental and thought provoking, but also just very beautifully written. So on that basis, I gave it a four out of five. And thank you to Isabel Kenyon for sending it to me. So there we have it, that's what I thought of On A Distant Ridgeline, stories by Sam Reese. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.